everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Using Digital Resources to Integrate Asian Pacific American Experiences and Stories in the Classroom. I'm Ashley Naranjo, the Manager of Educator Engagement at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. For the next hour or so, we'll share online resources to help you and your students as both mirrors and windows, reflecting on your own experiences and identity, as well as providing insights into other experiences and identities. It's appropriate that we're able to share these resources with you in May, which is of course, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, but these are also great resources that can be used for deeper learning year round. Many of the resources support skills in identifying perspectives and point of view or analyzing change over time. And those are great for the entire school year. We're lucky to be joined by several panelists, including representatives from Smithsonian Affiliation Museums from across the country, and we have a teacher with us as well. Uh, the session is part of a larger initiative that we're um, sharing with you today. Um, we held several workshops across the country, and many of the resources um, came from those in-person experiences and now are available to you to use in your classroom. A bit of housekeeping. If you are joining us live uh, and have questions, you, in, you can include them in the chat to the right side of the YouTube video, and we'll answer them throughout the session. I should also mention this Hangout will be archived and available for replay. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So first, we have Kristen. Then we have Rahul, Hannah, myself, Ashley, John, and Tess. Hi, thanks everyone. So during a collaborative teacher workshop that was hosted at the Wing Lung Museum in Seattle this spring, Rahul shared a presentation that we thought would serve as a great overview for everyone called You Can't Teach American History Without Asian Americans. This is an abbreviated version of that session, but provides a great timeline to be able to begin with. Rahul? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to change my screen so I can see the slides that are actually up there. Now, we do this particular presentation on a regular basis uh, for uh, professional development trainings for teachers. It is an incomplete timeline and it is designed in a way to touch on um, points of history that most people teaching American history would know about. Uh, Chinese workers on the railroad, and uh, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, cannery workers, but also to uh, punctuate that timeline with little known facts. And the reason we do that is to uh, really generate a sense of, ooh, what don't I know? And it tends to work. So this is the overall timeline. And like I said, it's very incomplete, but it's really just to get the point across. Uh, the second slide is <laughs> a recent uh, 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 research. I couldn't think of the word. Um, has enlightened uh, quite a few of us to the presence of uh, folks called the Manila Men. Uh, some argue that they were ethnic Chinese who had left China, uh, the Philippines on um, uh, uh, mostly Spanish boats, but others argue that there's no way to tell if they were ethnic Chinese or not. So. 1600s places Filipinos in the what becomes the United States. I think what is surprising to many people, it's almost as though uh, when I, and we do encounter this at our particular museum, at the Wing Luke Museum, is that, um, you know, Muslims aren't American. Well, if we really want to pinpoint when Muslims were in this part of North America, we would track back to the 1600s as well. So in doing this, we can pose the question and have a larger conversation about 
what major gaps in American history um, exist in the timelines we're presented within uh, typical school texts. The next slide is, of course, of Gamsan. Uh, Gamsan meaning Gold Mountain. Um, and this is generally the accepted timeline for Chinese immigration. It says Chinese immigration begins, but arguably um, uh, to other parts of the Americas, that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, the next slide tends to be kind of a surprise to most people. Civil War, the Union is dissolved. Asian and Pacific Islanders fight for both the Union and the rebels. There was some work done by the um, US Forest Service. I'm sorry, <laughs> Ooh, they're gonna kill me. National Park Service, um, with whom we work uh, quite closely. And they put together a pretty incredible uh, text on Asian and Pacific Islanders who served in the American Civil War. And what was a surprise to me, having done quite a bit of scholarship on South Asian diasporic uh, immigration and immigration policy was I had never known that we had South Asians, and I say South Asians because neither Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, India, and so on didn't, you know, they didn't exist until um, much later. But you can see the name at the bottom. Um, it says Organ, that should say origin. Uh, Punjab region, which is now Pakistan, and he was one of several dozen uh, South Asians who have been identified uh, either as coming from the East Indies or from India proper. Um, this generally triggers an incredible conversation among the teachers that this isn't true. And so we get into uh, great conversations about what we, um, as scholars, but also as museum professionals, um, what's our responsibility in uh, documenting. And so we generally here do not present anything that isn't documented. Um, so truth is irrelevant, or the lack thereof. The final slide is to show the timeline. This is actually built in Prezi, which gives a little bit of animation. So as you look through dates and events, it's not as um, painstaking as many timelines can be. But you can see important moments in history of 1942 and the incarceration of Japanese Americans, the uh, Filipino infantry. Um, you see the promise of citizenship, which then, of course, the byproduct of which is a considerable loss of rights in this country and then move on to 1944 and 1945. I'm skipping over this in general and keeping it pretty vague. Uh, this Prezi is available online and I believe Tess will be sharing it. Um, use it, change it, edit it. It's been a lot of fun. Every time somebody gives some more documentation, we try to add um, more to it. Uh, this is the base one that's available for the public. Um, Great, yeah, so the Prezi that Rahul just shared too um, is also included in what we're calling a Smithsonian Learning Lab collection by the same exact name as the YouTube video. Um, so in addition to some of the collections that we'll be going through, um, Smithsonian Learning Lab is a digital platform that you can share resources with other teachers, share resources with your students, um, and we've included this website, um, this Prezi link as part of that collection as well. Um, Rahul, did you want to kind of say any closing thoughts or, or add anything else? Well, I would love to know if anyone's actually online and with a question about the very notion that we can't teach American history without teaching Asian American and Pacific Islander American history. Um, for a lot of teachers, that tends to be, and a lot of professionals, that tends to be a little bit controversial. And I'd love to, love to know what people's responses to that is, are. 
Sure. So we have several people that are online right now. So if you have um, a response that you'd like to share with us and on YouTube, on the right hand side of the video, there's a chat area where you can say something. Um, I'd love for the panelists to also chime in a little bit, too, on this question um, about uh, Rahul's statement, you can't teach American history without Asian Americans. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to type in the chat or uh, panelists, um, any thoughts or any uh, follow up on that? Sure, this is Hannah from um, the AARC in Austin, Texas. I definitely believe that you can't teach Asian American history um, without the Asian Americans. And as an Asian American studies major myself, the way I present and talk to the public about what Asian American history is, uh, because oftentimes people confuse it with Asian studies or Asian history, is that it's the history um, in the United, it's United States history that you may not have learned um, in the classroom, but it is part of US history and of the Asian American community in the US. Uh, so that's the way I frame it for people. And when you kind of change that shift and change that framing, it activates people's minds to think about um, kind of the unwritten or unspoken histories that are, are in uh, US history. Absolutely. And this is Kristen, I'd like to chime in. I think it's important as, as the excuse the metaphor tapestry of sort of American uh, what America looks like grows and changes that there is this sort of model of culturally responsive teaching where we show our students um, who is part of our larger American story absolutely John do you have any thoughts uh, you might want to add or Tess anything else that you might want to add Oh, so John, I think you're on mute. Oh. I think we owe it to our students to, uh, uh, especially our Asian American students, we owe it to them to, to make sure that that type of material is included. Uh, coming from Lowell, an area uh, heavily uh, populated by uh, Cambodian American students, uh, you know, we, we owe it to them to include it uh, to make it uh, so that they can connect to the material. So I think it's extremely important. Excellent. And Tess, any, any final thoughts? Well, I had a question for Rahul. So looking at the screenshot, I see it looks like there's a YouTube video here and a few photographs. What other resources are located in this Prezi? Oh, I think you're on mute. I was on mute. <laughs> uh, uh, predominantly, in this particular uh, public version, it's images uh, and YouTube videos. So as you go from uh, point in time to point in time, uh, generally speaking, it just connects with images and video. I think uh, my plan is to actually have primary source material uh, within this Prezi that uh, for anything that you click on, you could actually download primary source material to your classroom or to a museum or wherever. Okay. I love too how you mentioned that as you give this presentation over time, it kind of evolves and develops based on who the audience is and the types of milestones that they think are important to be included as well. So um, I love that it's kind of this ever evolving collaborative collective timeline that that kind of continues to grow based on the resources that are available but then also kind of those milestones that people um, think haven't been often included in historical narratives um, that we see in textbooks or or in um, classroom you know American history classes so um, well, excellent. Folks, if you have any questions, like I said, um, you can click on the right hand side of the YouTube video and ask questions throughout the session. Um, but next up, I want to offer a little bit of time for Tess to go over um, a quick overview of the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which is, like I said, a digital platform um, that has millions of digital resources with tools for discovery, selection, and use. She's got the URL right there on the screen. Um, and so, Tess, without further ado. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so, yeah. 
the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which is a free digital platform um, that is designed to both give you access to all of the digital resources from the Smithsonian, along with others uploaded by our affiliate partners, is the platform on which we've built multiple sets or what we call collections of digital learning resources that you can use to help bring Asian Pacific American experiences in history, art, and culture into your classroom. Uh, on this site, not only can you find all of these resources, but there are also tools that will allow you to adapt and use these resources um, in the classroom. Uh, the website is for anybody to use, but it's targeted for uh, teachers and students in particular. And so, yeah, like Ashley said, I'd just like to give you a little overview about the site, what it is, how it works, and what you can find there. Um, and then I will show you how to find these collections that we've created for all of you. Um, there are a few reasons to use the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Um, it is a great and easy way to gain access to authoritative, authentic resources for instruction and assignments. Um, every Smithsonian resource you find on the site is vetted by experts, so you know the information attached to them is accurate. Um, it's a great way to deepen and contextualize learning with visuals and media. You can use it to empower student creativity and skills as knowledge constructors. The site is not only designed for students to use, um, to answer quiz questions, to look at resources like artwork and objects closely, um, but students can also create their own collections of resources on the site. And I'll explain again what these collections look like in a sec. And then finally, um, the site is also designed for you to use or build on the work of other educators. Um, you can copy and adapt a collection of resources that another educator has created, like the ones we're going to share with you today, um, and adapt it in ways that best suit your classroom. Um, so before I go any further, I want to define two of these terms that I've started to use. Um, the first are resources. These are the digital assets on the site, and they are the building blocks of what we call collections, which are groups of learning resources. I'll show you what these look like in just a sec, but um, for now, know that they fall into one of three categories, typically topical collections, teaching guides, and student activities. Here are a few examples of what uh, learning lab resources look like um, and the types you'll typically find on the site. Um, you'll find a whole bunch of artwork, artifacts and objects, photographs, uh, recordings, which include both audio and video. Um, so you'll find um, recordings that range from clips from Smithsonian Channel episodes to um, recordings of symposiums given by experts in their fields. Um, you'll also find a lot of specimens from the National Museum of Natural History, and you will also find texts, which include kind of a big spread of uh, different types, but include blog posts like the one pictured here, articles from Smithsonian Magazine, uh, but also letters and memoirs and other sorts of primary source documents. So like I said, resources are the building blocks of what we call collections. And this is a screenshot of one of the types, a topical collection. Um, we'll show you in a little bit what this looks like live on the site. But for now, know that each one of these tiles is a resource. And if I were to click on it, I could see that resource in depth and see information that's attached to it uh, by the museum. This collection in particular, uh, gathers resources on immigration policies that affect Asian Pacific Americans, and uh, it is a topical collection. A topical collection gathers resources on a particular topic or theme. Uh, the second type are teaching guides, which are very similar to topical collections, but they're designed for teachers to use. Um, and typically contain lesson plans or graphic organizers to help a teacher use the resources within this collection with his or her students. Um, this collection in particular is about artwork created by Roger Shimamura, who's a Japanese-American artist. Um, the creator of this collection 
um, who is a honors 10th grade English teacher, has gathered multiple artworks created by Shimomura, as well as um, a graphic organizer and a lesson plan to help other teachers um, think about how they might use this in the classroom. The final type um, are student activities. These are designed for students to go through themselves. So um, this collection in particular looks closely at one letter written by Yasuo Kuniyoshi, um, an artist, right after um, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, so this collection includes uh, quiz questions, um, created by Ashley, this is actually her collection, um, that asks students to look closely at this primary source document and answer questions about um, the purpose of the letter and um, ask them also to explain what it might reveal about um, being a Japanese American during this difficult time in history. Um, so like we've said, we're here today to share with you a huge group of collections that we've created of resources that you can use to bring Asian Pacific American experiences into your classroom. You can find them on the website by searching for APA 2018. I'll show you how to do that later on. Um, but you'll find, uh, if you search for that term, over 70 collections on a huge range of subjects created by not only the panelists here, but other educators um, ha who have adapted some of the collections and made their own on these topics. Um, some of the topics include Asian Pacific American actors, artists, athletes, and authors, Chinese gold miners, Hawaiian royalty, Chinese American exclusion and intersectionality, and a whole lot more. Jess, I wondered too, if you yeah. could just go back to that slide, what are we looking at here in this screenshot? I know some of the other ones were collections that were kind of enclosed activities or lessons that were on a given topic, but here on this slide, um, what are we looking at exactly? We're looking at a screenshot of the search results page. So this is what you'll see when you search for APA 2018 and click on the collections tab to view collections related to uh, my search term. Each one of these tiles is a different collection. When you go live on the site, um, you'll be able to see a preview of the title of the collection and who created it. If you click on the tile, you'll be able to view the collection itself. And Tess, one other question too, for folks that haven't used the Learning Lab before, maybe aren't you know, so familiar with it, is do we need a, a login for this? Is it free? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the, site question is free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the site is free and you don't need an account to go on the site and do a search, find resources and find collections. Um, so these are activities and resources that today teachers can basically have in their toolkit to be able to use in class tomorrow or start to kind of play around and discover and maybe even start to create their own collections like John has. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. Excellent. Uh, so today we want to show you uh, four collections in particular. We'll go and show you them in depth, what they contain and talk about how you might use them. Um, the first that we'd like to discuss is uh, Pioneers from the East, which was created by Hannah Wong at the Asian American Resource Center. So Hannah, I'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone, um, so coming to you from Austin and the Asian American Resource Center is part of the city of Austin's Parks and Recreation Department. We're in a division called Museums and Cultural Programs. So I just want to introduce a little bit and talk about uh, we are, from, from our knowledge, uh, the only city run uh, Pan-Asian Center, cultural center in the nation that's funded by tax dollars in this way. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I believe you all are sending out the information as well after the webinar. Um, but for this collection, Pioneers from the East, we focused on the Singh family. The city of Austin has an Austin History Center within the public library system, and they are the archival heart of the city of Austin related um, history. And so within the Austin History Center, there's three community archivists 
One is specifically focused on the Asian American community. And so the Singh collection was really special in that um, the current Singh family members, they no longer uh, go by the last name Singh. They are a mixed Chinese Latino family. Um, they found a lot of these original papers from their ancestor, Joe Singh, that came from when they were remodeling and putting in central air into their home in, in Austin, Texas. So starting out, you can find online um, resources on the second uh, item is a, a list of all of the Singh family papers and what's in the inventory for the collection. We found this to be a really helpful resource for educators to be able to go to that website and kind of see um, what items they have. There's a lot of interesting things like the papers uh, Joe Singh has um, from when he was working on Chinese world, on, as a Chinese railroad worker in Gold Mountain area in California. He made his, his way down to Austin eventually working on railroads as well. Um, originally, I believe a lot of Chinese stopped in San Antonio and then uh, he made his way in particular to Austin. So not a lot is known about the early years of how he met his wife, Frances Moreno Singh. But one thing we do know is that it was a very unusual marriage. It wasn't until Frances Moreno um, was trying to obtain her, her pension, her social security, that she realized because she married a Chinese man who did not have citizenship under um, the Chinese um, immigration laws, the, the immigration laws against Chinese, that she had lost her uh, citizenship. So she was a born and bred American um, in Austin, but she lost her citizenship due to marrying a Chinese man. So this wasn't, this was due to a lot of the anti-miscegenation laws um, that are not very well known. So for a while in US history, um, any female that, or a woman that married um, an illegal alien, regardless of race, um, they would, they would lose their citizenship. That law was later amended to only be towards Asians. So um, if you married somebody who was an illegal alien from Europe, that was okay. Uh, the woman would still retain her citizenship. But if it was an, a, somebody of Asian descent, they would lose their citizenship. And it wasn't for quite a while that this was uh, corrected. And it would be this law passed in 1907 that we're on right now. So an unusual marriage. And um, this uh, Joe Singh in particular um, lost his life uh, early on. So Frances Moreno did have to raise the family on her own. The, the family as a mixed race family in Austin did uh, encounter her for several lives because they didn't have the father around anymore. And there's a really amazing video uh, that done by our local PBS channel, KLRU, called Austin Revealed. It's a documentary series, and the Pioneers from the East series actually highlights three of the four original Chinese families in Austin. The Singh family one is really special in particular. Um, it kind of it talks about how they found those papers in the attic from uh, Joe Singh, also called Joe Hall in the paper. So there's a lot of uh, discrepancies in what name they went by, uh, what name he was uh, ascribed to. Um, in Austin, we refer to him as Joe Singh, and his legal name actually when he arrived in the U.S. was Joe Feng Sung. So it was very very different names he was going by. Uh, through a long process with the first Asian American community archivist, the Singh family was able to get their home, uh, which was brought by Margaret Singh. She was the first legal citizen that was able to purchase a home in Austin out of the family. Um, they still retained the home and they were able to get historical designation for it. So some of the major themes we're seeing in this collection, you can use it as a teaching collection in class. It does have a lot of questions and topics that you can go over with students. So these questions and topics and themes um, go through things like anti-miscegenation, um, where did the Chinese railroad workers go after they finished building the transcontinental railroad? Um, 
Texas history, of course. And then historical preservation is a huge theme that you can explore in this as well. So a major um, thing that we explore with our camps here and our youth programs here is the premise of um, primary versus secondary source material. So we've used, we've taken them to the Austin History Center where they can actually see those source materials and see that collection. It's been archived and uh, preserved properly by the archivist and it still gets brought out. There's pictures, there's tons of family pictures, there's um, documents that date back from the, early, the late 1800s. And then of course now we have the documentary and articles written about the family that served as secondary uh, resources. So is there any questions or um, Ashley, Tess, anything you like me to go over as well? Sure. No, thanks, Hannah. Um, I really appreciate that. So if folks have questions, again, you can put it in the chat on the right hand side of the video. Some things that I noticed that you talked about that I just wanted to point out, um, the idea of losing citizenship. I think that's something that we see in waves across American history. And so I think that's a really important idea um, to, to start to kind of flesh out. And I think this collection does a nice job of it. I also like that it uses oral histories alongside archival documents. Um, so there's kind of those primary and secondary sources that we're looking at, as well as the documentary um, with a contemporary grandson who kind of just found out his own family history and originally, um, if I, I'm not mistaken, kind of always saw himself as a Mexican-American and then kind of discovered this wonderful um, kind of lineage that he he was unaware of. So um, I really love the kind of story that's very captivating for students um, to kind of dig into that personal narrative. Um, Tess, did you have anything else to add? No, I thought that was great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Yeah, excellent. And like I said um, earlier, all of these collections um, that we'll um, be sharing throughout uh, today's webinar will be um, available by searching APA 2018. So um, if you like what you saw in Hannah's collection, um, she's actually got several collections that are created. Um, you can go ahead and check those out in the Smithsonian Learning Lab and we'll have the links um, in the description of the YouTube channel as well. Uh, but they're readily available and ready to use in the classroom tomorrow. So um, next uh, we have uh, Rahul from the Wing Luke Museum, um, who you heard from just a little bit earlier ago. Um, and he's going to be sharing the letters from uh, the Chinese uh, exclusion and family, um, letters from home, excuse me, um, and he'll share his collection with you all. Hello again. <clears throat> um, this particular collection uh, is within a larger series we're doing um, revamping the curriculum that the museum actually generates uh, as resources for teachers and for districts uh, not just in washington state but um, with an emphasis on our archives and collections and that's something that we have not um, done a lot of we have spent a lot of our energy on um, equally important things like documenting uh, oral histories or um, uh, working with scholars in the field of Asian American history so we can better give context as students and teachers and other guests come to the museum. Um, I guess I should say who I am. Um, <laughs> my name is Rahul Gupta. I'm the Education and Tours Director at the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience. Uh, in the United States, we're the only pan-Asian American uh, museum of our kind. We follow a very unique curatorial process, and it's a very democratic, uh, consensus-based, um, and we've applied the same standards within our education programs. Um, that's been a transition over the last few years. Uh, we focus heavily on storytelling and on dialogue. And so when going to artifacts and to our, our archives, it's been a little tricky without being able to um, know where to combine our place-based teaching with these artifacts. But I think I chose 
the right ones for all of you to use nationwide. Uh, if we go to the second slide, the first slide is just the title page. Um, this particular comic uh, comes from a, a, uh, 1898. And the whole focus of these uh, letters, what we're doing is we're interpreting it, uh, interpreting these letters specifically, specifically through push and pull factors in immigration. And so to better understand Chinese immigration out of China um, during the 1800s and early 1900s, one has to first look at colonialism in China and one, um, and as well as the American presence in China, but also the imperial presence of Japan. And so when you look at all those, uh, if you click over on the left, I believe with the, yeah, the, so this goes through uh, John Hay and the open door policy. Um, and of course, from the US perspective, it's it's always built within our, our history is that it's uh, based on uh, free trade. But uh, this does give us an opportunity to reconsider fair trade in relation to our own presence within a colonial structure within China. It seems a little much, maybe for younger students, but um, when it comes to uh, really focusing on the, the, the fair and unfair uh, uh, dichotomy, uh, they, they tend to understand that people had to make pretty hard choices. In the uh, next slide, we go to the beginning of the collection. These are uh, photographs from our uh, archive. This is a photo of a young gentleman um, in the Gom Hong store. And the collection itself, it, it, this online collection is made up of letters from uh, two different stores here in the Chinatown International District of Seattle, uh, WJ London and Gom Hong. A third company, Yik Fung, uh, we've got a lot of other archives from them, but not specifically these letters. And there was a, a I kid you not, a box of letters that was sitting behind the counter in a cabinet. And um, it was gathering dust, but it was a treasure trove of stories, first person, uh, well, I'll take that back. I think what's interesting about these particular uh, letters is that for a lot of the individuals, uh, the authors, so to speak, uh, would be going to someone who was um, literate, first of all, and was paid to write letters and get them back and forth across uh, the Pacific Ocean. And so by looking at letters in this way, we can use standard, uh, can we go to, I don't think it's the envelope one, the fourth slide, maybe the fourth slide. Sorry, Tess, can you go back to the last slide? Can you click, oh. <laughs> Can you click on the uh, um, uh, paper clip? So we do use pretty traditional uh, methods, um, looking at sources like History Matters, but then also uh, other uh, suggested uh, uh, techniques for analyzing letters. And the joke I made at the training when uh, folks came out was um, not to make fun of Ken Burns, but you know, when you watch a Ken Burns uh, movie on the Civil War, you've got the voice is my darling Clarita, you know, and you get this interpreted uh, sense of, of a, this moment in history. But that's what I wanted to do with these letters. We had strictly direct translations uh, done many, many years ago. It gave zero context, and it gave no sense of the author's voice or a sense of what it takes to actually craft one of these letters. And if we go to the next slide, um, this one, there's an aesthetic quality that cannot be uh, ignored. There's uh, amazing handwriting uh, analysis you can do and you can see where the strokes are deeper. Um, that's when the individual dipped it back in the ink. But 
I've added on the left hand side, you'll see um, a couple um, sources. One of them is a little, it's interesting. Uh, it's the translating idioms within the cultural context from Nanjing University. I, I, I won't say that it's perfect, um, but I think it gets the point across. If you are doing a straight translation, there is such a cultural loss between source and the culture in which it's being read. And so if you understand better the translation in that cultural context, you can make it relate to the individual in the a separate culture who's actually reading the text. That's what we did. Um, one of the uh, one of the women on my staff, she um, specifically studied turn of the century letter writing in China. It just so happened that we had this person with us, and I didn't even know that. I didn't remember that when we hired her. So we went through, and she was able to provide a much richer translation of all of these documents. And, you know, part of it too is the original uh, translator was predominantly a Mandarin speaker. Well, these are letters coming in from Toisan and other parts of Southern China at a time when there was an emphasis on, um, there wasn't the emphasis on, you know, everyone speaking Mandarin. So, you know, there are some uh, contextual nuances within each of these letters. But I want to go back to the main screen um, and then show one more thing and then hand it off. Um, we did build some quizzes in there. We don't have to click on that. Um, that's really an example of what you can do with this, whether it's in the classroom or within a cultural um, uh, institution. Simple comprehension questions. But we base everything in not just comprehension questions, as you would see in, say, like a, um, oh, what is it called? Story. Somebody help me. I can't remember. Anyway, um, but we do use a lot of uh, visual thinking routines instead. So as you go down in some of the questions, you can see it switches over. But it, ah, go back, go back. Um, do you see the slide with the crazy circles? Yeah. So this one in particular, I think, I think this is where we can truly say we've dived into a layer that I have not seen within um, individual institution collections. If you go to the top, you'll see that there's the formalities of respect, but then there are three other possible options. And those we've created hotspots within the screen and given you um, additional information. Um, I don't know that I can see the whole thing in the screen. OK. So the character is offset to the right of the column of characters, just as indents are used in English, writing to emphasize a new paragraph or to iterate that, that the text has significance. If you go back to the regular image, um, you'll see that there is an offset character in the third column. Um, I can't see which register it is. But that indicates a significance within this particular individual's interpretation of the uh, sender. So this was written by a paid professional. But each of those other circles connect with um, all right, I'll just tell them my favorite, and then we'll we'll move on. Um, over on the right-hand side of the top, you've got the big circle. Yeah. That gap is actually because the way that the individual has addressed the recipient, you actually would move the text down to show deference to that particular individual. And so built within the letter, it's not just the, the words themselves, but over on the left hand side you can see that we go into the construction of the letter that if you're trying to convince someone to send money because your family's starving you don't start out with all hell has broken loose send money now you have to acknowledge the work that this individual had done to set off to the united states they've already been given this sense of prominence not everyone struck it rich 
but there were other mechanisms for them to be able to support their families, um, some tied to pretty heavy uh, interest rates around here. But going back to the general uh, archive uh, or the collection, the way I would recommend using this collection is how you would use any letter within American history. These are, uh, at least in our museum's understanding, these aren't foreign letters. These are American letters. These are letters being written to Americans whose job within their families was to support families living in a situation that was, for the most part, untenable. Um, so as you um, go through and you can look at the, the translations, you can actually pull certain ones that you want to use to examine what a daughter or a sister might be writing versus a, um, a young man who's been studying at school. And so you can start to, to really get your students to understand the gender differences in how these letters are constructed and who might be writing them on their behalf to get that point across. Um, this was a fascinating project for us. And I think we um, tripped. I, I know I tripped into a gold mine of realizing I had a, a staff member who had actually um, studied a lot of this. So um, this entire collection is, in, in our view, a rich piece of um, American correspondence. That's great, Ravel. Thank you so much. I really love the connections too that are made between, you know, obviously history, but also culture, formalities, letter writing, narrative, um, even just the art form of letter writing as well, I think is really interesting. Um, and it sounds like from our first two panelists that if you have an attic or a cabinet that's collecting dust, there are potentially family Trevor treasure troves in there that you should really check out because um, it sounds like these two kind of archival packages have come from kind of the most unexpected places. So um, really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I want to, um, for the interest of time, jump to our next presenter. Um, and then, of course, if folks have questions, feel free to um, add them in the chat. Um, but Kristen Gallus um, from the Songus Industrial History Center is going to share with us uh, a collection she made called Their Stories, Lowell's Youth and Refugee Experience. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, my name is Kristen Gallus. I'm the project manager for education development at the Songus Industrial History Center in Lowell, Massachusetts. We are an education partnership between the University of Massachusetts Lowell's College of Education and Lowell National Historical Park. So we're actually located in the National Park and function as the education department of the National Park. And our mission is to inspire connections with the uh, city's industrial past, present, and future. Um, and one of the ways we do that is through our school programs. And in a little bit of history about Lowell, Lowell's been home to a successive waves of, refu waves of refugees and immigrants since its founding, um, particularly in the 1830s all the way up to today. Um, as John mentioned before, Lowell is home to the second largest Cambodian community in the United States. And today the city is uh, primary uh, location for refugee resettlement in the United States. Um, and to, uh, the most recent uh, groups of refugees are coming from Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, we realized a few years ago that the park's permanent exhibits were really reflecting these new waves of refugees and immigrants who are coming to the United States and particularly to Lowell. So we developed a small exhibit um, and we did this in conjunction with some community members and some students from the university to uh, highlight some of the most recent refugee youth that have come to the city. And so we, um, we featured students from uh, who came from Burma, Bhutan, Iraq, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and you can see um, the first, actually the second uh, photo is uh, sort of a, a large scale image of the exhibit. And so in the learning lab, we feature all of the text uh, from the text panels, um, audio recordings of the oral histories that were done with the youth featured in the exhibit. Um, and then if you 
so you can see here, this is uh, Nina. She was born in Nepal of Bhutan. Refugees from Bhutan. She was born in Nepal um, and lived in, her entire life in Nepal um, until she came to Lowell. Um, and all of the text panels show uh, their stories of um, why they left and then sort of their first experiences of what it was like to be in Lowell. Um, and then if you, uh, so there's the oral history uh, recording as well. Um, it, uh, Tess, if you go back to um, the main screen, the last one, so this is a large mural called the culture tree that's the main feature of the exhibit and it's a really amazing artwork and this is actually something that teachers can do in their classroom with their students um, the whole idea is a sort of a, a metaphor of a tree and the roots of the tree the bottom of the mural um, represents their past the trunk of the tree uh, represents their present so their student their lives in lowell today and then the the branches of the tree represent their future. Um, and this was a project we undertook with 18 um, refugee youth uh, with a partner organization called the International Institute of Lowell, which is a refugee resettlement organization. Um, and so this is the main feature of the exhibit. And um, if you can uh, navigate back to the, the main screen, Tess, you can see, um, uh, there's four students, four pictures of students, and then there's the flag representing our student from uh, the DRC. Um, their stories really give today's students or students from other communities a chance to empathize with refugee experience. I mean, these are kids, they're your, their age, they have the same kind of interests, but completely different stories of how they ended up where they ended up. Um, and we, um, one of the teachers who reused this collection or repurposed this collection uh, thought of it as a great way to prompt uh, her own students to do oral history interviews with refugees or immigrants in their community. So it's a great way to say, here's some examples of questions you could ask, uh, stories to compare to, and then do that sort of project with their own students. Excellent. Thanks, Kristen. This is a really great collection, too. I love the way that it's incorporated kind of the in-person gallery experience into an online uh, exhibit, but then also allows, you know, folks across the country to also hear these stories, too. So wonderful collection. And last but not least, um, we've heard from three museum specialists and educators, um, but we thought that it would also be great to hear from a teacher too. So we met John Plunkett um, at the Songus Industrial History Center um, during a workshop. And during that workshop, he created a collection on the Japanese internment. So John, would you like to walk us through your collection? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. So my name's John Plunkett, I'm an English teacher. I teach at the Bridge Program in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, the Bridge Program's an alternative middle school uh, for students who have not succeeded in the, the traditional school environment. They're at risk of either expulsion or uh, uh, failing out. And so we have a, a population mainly of uh, minority students and uh, students who are, come from impoverished backgrounds. And so that kind of leads me to my collection in that uh, I wanted to focus more on the uses of the collection and the, the reason to use these resources as opposed to the collection itself. So uh, if you could focus on the first uh, three uh, pieces of the collection, uh, I can explain the, the purpose behind it. Uh, we were working on a cross-curricular unit on uh, World War II. And so this was cross -cur curricular between the social studies teacher and uh, myself teaching English. And uh, these primary resources come in, uh, you know, great uh, hand for our students who have uh, trouble dealing just with text-based material. So when dealing with uh, uh, letter writing, this isn't a concept that comes naturally to them. So uh, all none of my students had uh, ever written a letter to another person and sent it to the post office, and none of them had received a letter. So uh, the, the, just the conception of writing a letter is very difficult for them. So to actually see these letters from uh, people who were in the internment camps uh, sending them to teachers was, 
very helpful that they could, you know, physically see and, and conceive of that process. And so based upon that, I could then develop lessons to help them uh, uh, expand upon that knowledge. And so uh, I then created a, a lesson for them where they would write a letter as if they were in the internment camp themselves. And then uh, uh, it, it taught them letter writing. They get to use their knowledge that they learned about the internment camps, what it was like in the camps, and uh, also connect to these letters that are in the uh, the, the uh, collection itself, because uh, you know they they discussed uh, they, they're writing to a teacher themselves. So it was based upon that collection, and it helps the students you know better connect to the concepts that they're learning instead of just reading about it. Um, in addition, another uh, uh, good use for the collection uh, along the same lines is if, if you click to the the slide with the ration book. The ration book uh, was another concept that they had difficulty with. Uh, in, in my portion of the, the lesson, we were also covering the diary of Anne Frank, where she frequently mentions the need to get ration books in order for them to get fed. And they had zero concept of what that meant, uh, not coming from a, a war background, obviously. And so uh, in, when they were able to see this coupon book and what, what would need to be done during wartime in order to uh, get food through a ration, it, this, this uh, little artifact was really helpful in them visualizing what uh, the process was like and what it meant to not have uh, whatever you wanted to be, not be able to go to a store and just get anything that you had to, uh, you, know, you were only allowed certain amounts of material and uh, uh, it, it connected directly to the material that they were working on in the classroom. And so I, I think that this is uh, one of the, the great uses of the, the, the lab itself is that ability to connect with the material through primary sources that are, are widely available online. And uh, it, it was extremely helpful for our World War II unit. The, the students uh, re really were able to connect with it and it, it helped them uh, to, to learn the material and, and uh, connect it to themselves, which, which I think it was, was absolutely key to the process. Thanks so much, John. I, I love too that it was kind of a, an interdisciplinary across subjects, um, thinking through kind of how it connects to other texts that they've read before, um, connections to other subject areas. So it's kind of this nice um, marriage of a lot of different subject areas in one in one collection. Um, and then I also love too that it's um, another example of how you know we have some local examples that we've been showing um, in some of our collections, but this is also kind of on a national scale. Too. To, um, and to specifically showing how students their age were writing to their teachers asking for books. I think in that third letter that you um, that you had mentioned, there's you know all these exclamation points, and I think they start with "Oh gosh, guess who it is," you know. And so even just the kind of you know types of writing styles that each of these letters hold um, during difficult times is really interesting too. So um, if you get the chance, I would highly recommend to the other teachers that are watching tonight um, to take a peek at John's collection. I think it's a really great example um, of an adaptation of other collections and a collection of primary sources that students can really kind of engage with and, and do a deep dive with. Um, so next, I'd like to turn it over to Tess, and she's going to show us just a little bit about the Learning Lab. I know we're running just a little behind schedule, so we'll try to keep it um, to about an hour and 10 minutes or so. Um, right now, we're at about an hour. Um, of course, you can always uh, if you have to leave right now, um, you can always come back to the archived version of this YouTube video and watch the replay of the last 10 minutes. Um, really what we're going to dive into now, though, is how you can get started, how you can access these collections, and how you can actually create your own. So, Tess? Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, so, as we've been mentioning uh, throughout the panel tonight, the Learning Lab is free to use. You don't need an account to find the resources and collections we've been talking about tonight. 
However, if you'd like to create your own collections, adapt some of the ones uh, that we've shown within the platform, um, that's when you'll need an account. And creating one is free and easy. On the home page, um, you'll see the button to sign up in the upper right hand side of the screen. Just click that, follow the prompts, and you'll be good to go. Um, Searching on the site is also easy. In the top left hand side of every screen, you'll see a magnifying glass. Hovering over this will open up a search bar and uh, just type your search terms in and click enter. Uh, here's an example of a search for um, Chinese American. Um, this will give me all of the resources from the Smithsonian related to my search terms. And you can see here, um, I've received over 3,000 results. Each one of these tiles, um, just like in a collection, is a resource that I can click to see more in depth and get more information about. Um, so say that uh, 3,000 resources is a little bit too much to go through. Um, luckily, there are tools to help me refine my search. Um, if I click on Refine Search um, underneath the search bar in the upper left, it allow me to narrow my search by resource type, uh, whether or not it's on exhibit or resource provider, um, the Smithsonian Museum or unit that that uh, resource belongs to. So I'm gonna narrow it by image and I'm gonna say, I just wanna see resources from the National Museum of American History. And I've been able to shrink my search by 2000 results. So if I click on one of these, I can view it more in depth, I can zoom in and out, and if I click on the information tab in the upper left, I can see information attached to that object by the museum that holds it. Um, that information varies resource to resource, but typically contains information about when it was made, who owned this object, who made it. Um, and this hat in particular contains additional information written by a museum curator about the symbolism behind um, having a dog head bonnet um, during the early 1900s for a Chinese American family. Um, to find uh, the collections that we've been talking about, those APA 2018 collections, um, you'll search for them the same way. Just type in APA 2018 in the search bar. And when you go to the results page, it'll first show you resources related to your search term. But because we're looking for Learning Lab collections, you'll want to click on the tab that I've highlighted in red here. And you'll be able to see the collections um, that we've created um, on Asian Pacific American experiences and stories. Um, finally, or almost finally, uh, if you'd like to copy a collection to your own account to adapt it however you like, whether that's bringing in your own graphic organizers, bringing in uh, images or other resources from another website, you'll want to copy that collection to your account. Uh, once you have an account, in order to copy a collection, you'll just click on the overlapping squares icon in the upper right. I've highlighted it here in red. Now, what we've talked about tonight um, in terms of using the Learning Lab is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, for information on how to create your own collections from scratch, use tools like the quiz questions and hotspots that you saw earlier tonight to find strategies that work really well with museum resources and a whole lot more. We've created a guide to the Learning Lab, um, which you'll find included in the Learning Lab collection that's linked in the description of tonight's online panel. Um, so Ashley, are there any questions? Uh, it looks like we are good on questions. One thing that I wanted to mention, like you said, all of the resources, the online collections that we've shared, the Prezi, um, a guide to how to get started with the Learning Lab, whether it's specifically for looking for Asian Pacific American resources or using this platform um, for other subject areas as well. 
It's all available in the YouTube description, um, as well as on the Learning Lab by searching APA 2018. Currently, you just saw about four different collections, and there's actually over 74 collections that have been created this past year. Um, and that's actually special thanks to um, the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, which is administered here at the Smithsonian through the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, which has allowed us to be able to do things like um, offer workshops across the country in Seattle, Austin, and Lowell, Massachusetts, and also to dedicate some time to be able to create these collections for teachers and students to use in their classrooms. Um, in October of 2018, if you're located in Los Angeles, California, we'll also be visiting another Smithsonian affiliate museum, the Japanese American National Museum, um, and you should look for other uh, collections that'll be popping up um, from teachers as well as museum educators related Related to that workshop as well, um, again with the hashtag APA2018. Um, so stay tuned for information about that event um, via social media. Um, and uh, Tess, I wanted to mention too, we're very active on uh, Twitter too. I think um, throughout the broadcast, we've also been tweeting um, some of the links to the collections that our affiliate partners have shared. Um, so feel free to uh, visit us at Smithsonian Lab. Um, you can mention us, you can uh, favorite us, you can follow us. Um, and there you'll also find great ideas for ways to incorporate these types of primary and secondary sources into the classroom. Um, I think for APA Heritage Month, we've had one every school day too. So we've been able to share a lot of resources with folks um, and ways to adapt them and use them in the classroom across subject areas and across grade levels. The last piece of information we wanted to share too is to not be a stranger. This is, you know, a very short webinar. We tried to condense a whole lot of great information into it. Um, but if you go to the Learning Lab homepage, which is learninglab.si.edu, and on the bottom right of every single page, it matters that much to us, um, click on the question mark icon. Um, you'll be able to actually send us our team. There's a, a large team of us that are working on this um, platform and making it the best for teachers and students. But you'll be able to send us questions as well as feedback, um, and that'll come directly to us. And we can also um, answer any questions or even help you brainstorm ways that you might use these resources in your own classroom. Um, we'd also love to see anything that you create too. So as you're creating collections, feel free to publish them. So not only you and your students benefit from them, but we can also benefit them from them as well as the teachers across the country. With that, Tess, was there anything else that you wanted to add? That was it. Great, wonderful. Um, any of our other panelists, anything else before we say we bid adieu to uh, all of our, our viewers here? All right, well, I know we've got folks from, from all different time zones um, from across the country that have joined us today. And so we're thrilled to have you. If you're watching the archive, thank you so much. We've also included this archive within a Learning Lab collection as well. So all sorts of ways to um, find these resources and get started using them in your classroom. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.